Hi there everybody, this is me, Patricia Winrow at the Cable Easel. This is a program, as you know, that is devoted to painting and drawing from life. Landscapes, still life, flowers, sometimes portraits, and always the subject matter is either brought into the studio or I work from sketches. Today, with a, I hopefully some humor attached to it, I'm going to call this my mountain bashing painting program because um, over the past uh, few years, I have seen gathering in flea markets and yard sales and so on, absolutely dreadful mountain pictures that have come from some strange source of instruction on maybe television programs. And um, I think that um, with, a, with a very small effort, I'm going to try to point out what mountain painting should be, in my opinion, as a um, realist landscape painter. Um, uh, I work from sketches, um, but most of the time I work out there in the wild. When I travel, I take paints, very little clothing, a lot of paints, and I work small because to transport large canvases is obviously more difficult. So, um, for instance, when I went to Taos, New Mexico, there is a place called the Little Grand Canyon in Taos. This is a, uh, this is a painting of the Little Grand Canyon. Uh, my son was with me. He climbed up onto this incredible rock formation. And then, uh, to give scale, I wanted to show the size of these places. And human beings are a very fine source of scale. Uh, he proceeded to climb farther and he went all the way up to the top and there he is silhouetted against the sky. Gives you some idea of the size of these places. Um, here, uh, let me remove the Taos one. I was out there in that general area. This is near Albuquerque, which is not far away. This is American mountain paintings. This is the Sandia mountain range at sunset. Mountains are not always br brown or blue with snow on them. They can turn brilliant uh, pink and mauve and scarlet and so on. This Sandia range is at about five or six o'clock in the afternoon. This is obviously an adobe uh, southwestern Mexi uh, New Mexican house. The Sandia range turns these incredible colors. They're not, as I say, always the same color. Um, there is a painting behind me here of the Wasatch Range. This is a way out in Utah. Uh, the Wasatch Range, this mountain it changes color. This one is all rock and it's got a little tiny bit of snow on it. This mountain in front of it is mauvish blue. Then there's another set of mountains that come down. They are all full of green foliage. And I'm illustrating, or trying to illustrate, that this formula mountain paintings which are coming out of these TV programs are unobserved, not paid attention to, and not worked from life. So, um, up here is the Sandia mountain range, this, uh, this mountain, this sunset. This is early in the morning, same mountain range, different colors early morning it becomes tan and mauve and kind of bluish gray. Um, this is the same range as the, as the sunset scene you saw. So with some other pictures that I have to show you, uh, I'll talk about it as I go later on. I'll put this one away and t tell you how I go about painting these scenes from a sketch. This sketch I did in pen and ink and some pencil when I was in uh, a place incredibly enough called Purgatory. Uh, it's in um, Colorado. It is a little bit west of Durango, somewhere on the, way, on the way to Taos, New Mexico. And this is a sketch done 
right there on the scene, stopped by the roadside and did a, uh, a, a drawing of this place called Engineer Mountain. I took color notations in words. I'll get to painting in just a minute, but I have to preamble it. You can see there my color notations of what, uh, what was happening on that particular day at that time. Pale sky, no clouds, the mountain was misty mauve green. That's my language. I understand what I'm saying. And people might be able to go out there and use their own language when they're taking color notations. So I want to show you that you do not have to rely on National Geographic magazine photographs taken by somebody else, nor do you have to rely on what you might remember uh, from a time that you may have been traveling in the mountains. You can take sketches. That took less than a half an hour. It may take you longer, but it's very much worth the effort so that when you come back and you have the information there that you need. Okay, let's begin by placing this mountain, this mount, this, uh, this Engineer Mountain, I'm sure that the Indians had a different name for Engineer Mountain. Um, it, it, that probably came along from the settlers or the people who, who were out there digging for coal, or gold, or whatever they're digging for on the, in these mountains. Uh, that's the name that came to it. Um, I'm placing the mountain, hopefully not exactly dead center. That's always wise. Well, it's dead center. Huh? Can I tell you? No, here's dead center. So I'm a little bit a little bit off-center, which is the what you're attempting to to come up with. It's a better composition if it's a little bit off-center. Um, otherwise, it's just too predictable. Uh, the same as in the Utah mountain, uh, there is a mountain in the rear. There's another uh, a rise in the hills here uh, as it comes toward you. And I've got some scale uh, uh, motifs in the background, in the middle ground here, to give you some idea of the size of these of these mountains, I'm afraid that with many many mountain pictures that are coming out, size is really not paid attention to. They could be little tiny mountains, or they could be enormous ones like the uh, Himalayas. You never can tell which ones they are. But I'm laying this out, as you can see, with very simple lines, trying to tell you exactly how I go about it when I'm there on the scene. Here is where the lake begins. The lake is here in the foreground. It is for, I picked it of course because of the reflections. I'm being a, a real reflection, a reflection drunkie. I, I, I can't think of anything more wonderful to paint than reflections. This mountain comes down even though it is interrupted by those uh, absolutely stupendous, um, uh, stupendously tall evergreens. They sure do grow big out there, um, which is why one of the reasons when I travel out there I want to be able to a record uh, the, 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 the remarkable uh, kind of forests that we fortunately still have. A lot of them are disappearing, a lot of people are just cutting them down for lumber, and we do have to build houses, so the dilemma is there. Where do you get the lumber And when we build houses? I have a feeling that we might be able to tap into some more, well, not less fragile resources than our forests. Um, I'm, as a landscape painter, I'm really very conscious of what is happening out there because I have gone back after a number of years of being away and found that what I painted years ago is now gone. And uh, so my paintings become almost documents of, um, of what used to be. This little ranch, uh, it's a little sort of a dude ranch where you can roll, go and rent a horse and ride through these wonderful mountains. Not very far. They don't take you very deep into the mountains. The horses are, are, are um, they have to uh, take many different uh, packs of people during the day. So you take them on fairly uh, short trips uh, up these hills, which is about all anybody can take, actually. And uh, the, there is a maximum maybe of 15 horses. And it's quite wonderful to watch the, even though they're tourists, and we all love tourists because they, they bring money into the areas that are desperately needing it. Well, this is a layout, a layout of where I'm going. So according to my notations, I am going to begin to simply block in a very, an almost colorless sky. I do not put it in with an enormous brush. I I put it in with a what I call a painter's brush, not a house painter's brush. Nothing wrong with house painters, but you don't attempt to do fine arts with a house painter's brush. Um, this is uh, as, about a, as pale a blue as I think I want to get. I'm working on a canvas board. I was asked at one of my live shows whether or not canvas board is acceptable for all painting. The answer was no, you should use stretched canvas. All of these little paintings that I showed you are on stretched canvas. For instance, right here, this is a stretched canvas. The canvas board, first of all, enables me to come 
and to not spend an enormous amount of money on this uh, on the demonstration pictures not that they're not worth it and I do sell these demonstration pictures and canvas board is going to last as long as you're going to want it to but for the most part you would use I would use and make and and, and um, recommend using stretched canvas little ones do not cost that much you can get them at uh, various uh, uh, painting supply outlets for under four dollars the little ones the bigger ones are five six seven eight nine and ten but um uh, the use of canvas board is uh, is very acceptable for beginners that uh, this canvas board probably cost they were they were probably three for for five dollars uh, I give these this information for people who go to art stores and are a little bit put off by the price of art supplies. The one thing that I do feel that you must spend money on is brushes. The brushes should be red sable. They should not be these uh, school student brushes that are uh, made out of camel's hair. They have no body. They have uh, no substance. And they leave hairs in the paint on the canvas. Drives you crazy. So the sable brushes are the best. Uh, anywhere between the numbers four and eight or ten are the, about the sizes that you're going to need, except for a brush called a liner brush. Uh, which I use for doing the very fine lines that you saw me sketch with and also grasses and uh, little itty bitty figures like maybe uh, birds and um, people far away on a mountaintop such as I just showed you. Um, uh, that painting that I showed you with, the, uh, with my son on, the, on those rocks in the little Grand Canyon out of Taos, New Mexico took me about, well that sort of painting will take a, anywhere between two and three hours. Uh, you have to have very patient people uh, traveling with you that are willing to sit on a mountain and read while I take two or three hours to paint. Uh, geez, just pieces of information that you should know. All right, a cloudless, almost colorless sky. It is somewhat blue, but we don't want, we don't mean to imply that skies are anything like white or uh, they, they are many, many different colors, but a cloudless uh, sky in the west tends to be extremely pale blue. All right, so we have the uh, background. That is, that is all that we're going to spend time on at this point. And I've got the mountain to contend with. It's, I, I've put on my notes that it is misty, mauvish gray. Well, mixing those colors, misty, mauve, green, let's get the mauve. Here's the mauve. Here is a basis of uh, some pale color. Let's see, let's see whether or not this is going to work, whether it is misty, mauve enough. Uh, see whether or not the distance of that mountain is going to be able to be told with the color that I'm selecting. Is that far enough away? Is it misty enough? Uh, I think a little bit more mauve is going to be needed uh, towards, the, uh, towards the edge of this mountain because, you see, if you start a mountain off too dark, you don't have anywhere to go later. You, how dark can you get if your mountain becomes dark? And color focus takes place as well as distance focus in sizes. You have to uh, remember that there is a lot of difference in color focus. The further away it gets, the more misty, the more indistinct, and the more uh, subdued in tone. So uh, when, you're, when you're doing mountains, and if you're not there to observe, you have to take notations and then uh, follow the notations rather carefully when you, when you get back to work on them later. I do this many times. I will do, I'm going to do it with the remarkable colors that are in the mountains right now. Uh, this, uh, this season when you're driving through, the best that you can hope for is to take uh, voluminous uh, sketches and drawings and notations. All right, we have what looks like a cutout. Well, I've got to put some pale tones in here to show you what I have notated on my pencil drawing. The pale tones are going to be uh, running down the side here uh, because this is, this is not a snow-covered peak. It also is not a um, it's not a uh, green. Uh, it's got some growth on it, but it's got it's got mountain outcroppings, rock outcroppings, and they tend to be rather uh, rather beautiful pale colors. There is a, a ridge up here that looks like it's paler than the rest, and it's it's sending down uh, maybe rocky formations, even even natural erosion of the. Um, 
of the of the uh, rocks and the, and the whatever dirt is captured up there. A lot of most of these uh, western mountains are extremely uh, rocky, and what you see from a distance that are different colors are rock outcroppings. So uh, forget about the continuously snow-covered mountains or the mountains that have got tremendous pale, um, misty sunshine hitting them, it is very rare that you will see what is being shown on some of the other programs with instructions. They are, the instructions are absolutely unobserved. They, they will tell you that this is the way that mountain looked at that time, but they rarely look that way. So um, to continue my theme of bashing the, uh, the mountain instruction paintings, I'm at it right now. All right, I'm going to take a slight break now. We've, we've, we've managed to paint a rather huge mountain in a few minutes. Don't go away, I'll be right back. This is part one, by the way, but I'll be right back. again and um, while we are having that slight break it suddenly occurred to me that the words of our national anthem that are that go the purple mountain majesties is absolutely true those mountains out there tend to be purple a good deal of the time hard to believe and I never see purple in any of the paintings that I see uh, that are uh, that are being shown on, 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 on the programs that I am today bashing so uh, remember that uh, there is uh, there is truth in that song uh, so um, enough said about that. Let me continue. As you can see, there is a mauvish, uh, misty quality tone to that particular um, uh, distant mountain called Engineer, mountain, Mount en Engineer Mountain. Now I'm coming a little bit closer to the foreground. That means the color is beginning to become a little bit less misty, a little bit more distinct, and uh, one can interpret these distant, uh, these distant hills with a little bit of freedom. Uh, following, follow, not following, but using my sketch as the reference material of the moment, I'm sketching in what appears to be a very distant uh, evergreen uh, range back there with a well I'm using some I'm using some uh, sap green uh, and making it slightly darker than what the distant mountain is keeping in mind that we're still dealing with there you go my my palette is showing you what an absolute dreadful mess this is but I understand what's happening here <laughs> and uh, and uh, letting you in on the secret of my messy palette is just another way of showing you how you how you work with oils uh, the um, the putting in of this uh, of this distant range here is done with purposeful strokes nothing tricky no huge brush full of color that is going to hopefully look like what uh, what you're after uh, it is it is um, it absolutely purposefully put in. These strokes mean something. They are reduced in paint with a little bit of my Marajay medium and some of my uh, some turpentine. I'm dealing also with the question of time, trying to get as much done to show you. But when you're out there working in the wild, you have time as your enemy as well. Not just this program, but the uh, enemy of uh, how the light changes, how the sun has a very annoying habit of going to different places in the sky 
And, uh, of course, if it didn't, we'd be in serious trouble, wouldn't we? Um, the distant range here that is becoming darker, doubtlessly it is a different, um, it is a denser forest uh, growth, and that's why it seems to be darker uh, in this area. Not that the, there's no shadow from the clouds. This is a cloudless day. This is just a much more dense uh, growth uh, here with... Um, with a, a, a rather e enormous amount of evergreens uh, climbing down this hillside. Either it is a virgin growth or it's a very old growth and the, um, the clear cutters haven't come through yet or the fact that it's a state park means that it has been saved. Um, when you see that happen you realize that there is nothing going on there that is going to be uh, that is going to get rid of this uh, wonderful old growth. You learn all this as you're out there working in the wild. This is a um, what I'm doing in here, according to the sketch, is a kind of um, uh, it's a it's a rock formation. Obviously, it is uh, eroded. The wind has eroded it, or it is a mesa, which is what you find out there in the west. Uh, those mesas are uh, terrific. They're the tops of flat mountains that happened billions of years ago, to quote Mr. Thingmabob. Uh, Mr. Carl Cosmos, I believe his name is Sagan, but he does take you on some interesting uh, uh, lectures about what happens to the areas of the planet which um, you wouldn't know otherwise unless you're a painter like me and out there watching all these things that are happening. You can see I'm still working with very subdued tones and being very interpretive about this kind of um, about this kind of uh, painting. Uh, there is a very pale streak running down here. It's probably a fire, uh, a fire cutting. In other words, you cut the forest down uh, to prevent fire from spreading. And the, my guess is that this national forest over here, this uh, very heavy growth, is, because, is there because the fire was preventing, uh, prevented it from getting burned down. Fires are important out there. They clear the land, uh, but they are also sometimes extremely devastating as we've seen in California just recently. The uh, f fire is something that you'd really have to learn and when I'm out here seeing these cut places I realize that um, I'm learning a great deal also about how the, there is land management needed and uh, very very beautifully taken care of by places like the Nature Conservancy and the Bureau of Land Management which is BLM. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is associated, is affiliated with this station in a sort of a minimal and interesting way since our uh, sale of Art for Open Lands, which took place here last year. And I, as a landscape painter, am interested in the work of the Nature Conservancy uh, being, uh, you know, devoted to the business of saving this absolutely remarkable country and these natural resources, which many times are in terrible trouble because of commercial uh, enterprises. Um, as you can see, following my sketch and hoping that you can really understand the application of this color in very pale tones, uh, as I speak, um, I hope to interject every once in a while some uh, salient and interesting and helpful uh, suggestions. Uh, there is a tremendous variety of greens taking place out there, even though there is a fall of the year. Some areas do not turn um, uh, orange and rose and uh, and uh, scarlet uh, at the same time that others do, and many times <clears throat> in the distance here, in my my notations tell me that there is orange and amber and ochre and yellow ochres in the um, in the meadows and in the distant hills. So um, I will I'll just introduce that very slightly here as we get down to the area where there are deciduous trees. Uh, the um, the little evergreen growths up on the hills tend to remain green. Uh, most, uh, most, uh, most during the year, except of course when it gets to be snowy and they get all covered with snow. So introducing these pale tones here, maybe even once in a while there's a very brave yellow tree that, uh, that pops up. Uh, I'm relying a little bit on my memory of this, uh, on the brilliance that sometimes hits these mountains. Um, e despite my notes, I can, I'm going to have to also try to remember, uh, have, to have a little bit of recall of what it is that happens, uh, that happens uh, at this time of year. I was there just as things were beginning to turn. Of course, they turn sooner out there in the West than they do here. 
Uh, at least I think they do. Uh, that may be that may be absolutely um, a mistaken idea of mine that they turn sooner. But boy, there's an awful lot of them that turn. And when they turn, uh, it's breathtaking. You can you can barely drive a car through this area when the leaves are turning. You you find yourself paying almost too little attention to the road as you're driving along. So uh, <clears throat> if you have a chance, and 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 sometimes those opportunities present themselves, do head west uh, at the time of the leaf changing because it is it is a sight which is uh, virtually indescribable uh, it's even almost impossible to capture on film because it's so spectacular however um, uh, when I'm out there and when I find myself in these places I uh, set aside a great deal of time I do very little sightseeing and very little um, uh, you know, restaurant hopping, I'm out there painting the landscape. It's absolutely my thing. All right, so we have the beginning of a, of a I have a few minutes left before all this begins to, occur, you know, before the time begins to crowd in on me. Let me interject here some of these tiny evergreens that I have in my sketch. They are nothing more than sort of arbitrary little, little, um, tri uh, little uh, pointy things in the distance. They're very small because we are dealing with huge landscapes, enormous landscapes, and little tiny trees I find are absent in the paintings that I am, the mountain paintings that I am this morning bashing, unabatedly and without shame, I am bashing those mountain paintings because they are missing so many points. The little itty bitty trees that are growing, I'm using a combination of, of um, uh, sap green and some, uh, uh, what is this? It's bird sienna. Um, these small trees give you some idea of scale, some idea of the condition of the trees. If they are, if they are in good shape, they're usually very brilliant. But most of the time, you'll find that the little ones can be seen only in silhouette. Only in silhouette. There is no light on the side of these little trees coming from some imaginary uh, source of sunshine. They're little. Um, little pointy triangles off into the distance nestled in the meadows of other growths and so on peeking their heads up over the um, over the deciduous trees so the business of painting pine trees if we don't have as many as we'd like to have on long island they're all out there and when you travel take a sketchbook for heaven's sakes you'll have the best time and it's not supposed to be work it's supposed to be a touring of observation and a tour of uh, remarkable recording of this country so as you as, as you see uh, zipping right along and the trees are getting closer to us these are a little further away than this one this one is directly behind the lodge uh, which is where the uh, the dude ranch uh, activities take place and those lodges are neat too they're always always got great stone fireplaces with a fire going in them and then of course the proverbial inevitable gift shop that sells things that you can't live without such as stones rocks sh um, bits of petrified wood uh, Indian uh, arrowheads, etc., and so on. But uh, you know, who can resist a good gift shop? Even though you know that those things are probably, well, m many times made in Taiwan, but they are uh, there for the the whole flavor of the trip to this um, to this amazing land we live in, Long Island. The best we can do is to find a good-sized cliff, and we call it a mountain. Well. Having talked at you for a long time now, um, I'm going to break this program. This is part one of my mountain bashing effort, but it is actually called Mount uh, Engineer Mountain. Please uh, make sure that you f uh, tune in on the second part of this so that we can conclude this program and you can see the general finished product of my uh, mountain paintings far away from Long Island, but nevertheless still part of the painting world. Bye-bye. See you next time.